Greetings. So I uh, realized as I was doing this that I really don't have much on diabetes in here. So I'm just going to do a dozen or so slides. <clears throat> I think the usual assumption is that most of what you'll learn about diabetes that you'll learn uh, when you learn pharmacology. But I do want to just throw out some basic processes for you to be thinking about until you get to that. So the basic definition of diabetes is that uh, it means, diabetes means to go through her siphon. It's named that because of the substantial urine output. Uh, almost always uh, folks will have an increased urine output, much less in type two than in type one. Mellitus means sweet. Years ago, um, they used to actually taste the urine to see if somebody had diabetes. Diabetes, diabetes insipidus, as you know, is a uh, substantial urine output, usually 30 liters or so a day. Um, that's associated with uh, uh, an ADH problem, a lack of ADH. Um, and those people uh, will have substantial urine output, but if you taste it, it it's insipid. Insipid means doesn't have flavor or taste. Um, we've actually transitioned that word to a person being insipid and not really being very interesting or having taste, but um, the original meaning was lacking flavor. So there's various different kinds of diabetes. Um, most of us are familiar with type one and type two. Please note that that is supposed to be Arabic numerals, not uh, Roman numerals. We stopped using the Roman numerals about uh, 12 or 14 years ago. Um, we had used them back in the 1950s, then we went to IDDM and NIDDM, and we went to insulin requiring and non-insulin requiring, and we had a bunch of other classifications. Now we're back to type 1 and type 2, but we use the Arabic numerals to show that this isn't that same classification from the 1950s. Type 1, by definition, is uh, usually defined as autoimmune, although there is a small percentage of those people that have idiopathic type 1. Um, the thing they share is damage to the beta cells and basically a lack of the ability to produce some um, insulin. So um, those folks will, you know, produce no insulin. Uh, type 2 is usually insulin resistance. A um, couple of other characteristics of that we'll talk about in a minute. Type 1 and a half is of greater interest as time goes on. Uh, these are the latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. And basically, these people kind of a mixed presentation. They won't have the dramatically um, high sugars and presentation with DKA as type 1s often do. Um, but when you check them, they're actually producing less than the normal amount of insulin. And we'll talk in a minute the best lab test to do that because insulin levels in and of themselves might not be the best way to do that. Gestational diabetes is exactly what it says. Um, it's a diabetes that only occurs during pregnancy. Those women have an increased risk of having type 2 later on in life, um, just because the hormones that um, are produced in pregnancy tend to mimic some of the same effects. So the hormones that are involved in diabetes, these are all things that we can influence um, pharmacologically. And so insulin, there's lots of different types of insulin. There are certain uh, medications that stimulate the production of insulin. Uh, the USMLE review actually has a pretty good discussion of that. Uh, glucagon is a hormone that raises sugar levels. Uh, we now know that several of the medicines that we give will actually suppress glucagon as well as uh, increase the output of insulin. Uh, the incretins are relatively new medicines and a relatively new hormone. Um, GLP-1, or the glucagon-like peptide 1, uh, is actually the thing that we're most interested in. Uh, they're secreted by the small intestine, uh, and they have lots of effects. We'll talk in a minute about the ominous octet and the various places that the GLP-1s work. SGLT2 is a uh, hormone that is found inside the kidneys. Basically, it causes the reabsorption of sugar. If you, uh, <clears throat> if you impair that or uh, block that, they'll actually pee out substantially more sugar, lowering their blood sugars. Um, the medicines which do block that actually tend to cause weight loss, lower blood pressure, as well as improve blood sugars. And somatostatin is a relatively new hormone that we're talking about in regards to diabetes. Uh, 
There are medicines that will impact it, um, and it, it uh, inhibits both insulin and glucagon, which is an interesting effect. Uh, so um, as time goes on, we'll, we'll know more and more about that. We don't know as much as we'd like to at this point. So going back to type 1, so we know it probably has a genetic element. Some people will get uh, uh, some sort of a virus, maybe a Coxsackie virus, which seems to uh, simulate some of these hormonal things. We know that there's certain HLA means human leukocyte antigen. There's a bunch of a HLAs that we test. Um, B27 is associated with ankylosing spondylitis and, and DR3 and DR4 uh, seem to be associated with um, type 1 diabetes. We often do not test them, uh, but that may be something that we will do more as time goes on. Uh, they'll often have certain antibody levels, usually the GAD and the, um, uh, the autoimmune one, but we'll talk about those in a minute when we talk about lab work. Um, and people with type 1 diabetes are at greater risk of having any of the other uh, type 1 auto, um, sorry, autoimmune processes, Hashimoto's, Graves, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis, or celiac. Type 2 is more of an insulin resistance process. Basically, they have plenty of insulin, but the uh, cells become progressively more resistant to it. Therefore, they produce more insulin. So if you do do a insulin level, uh, it will be high. Now, usually we don't actually do an insulin level. We'll do a C-peptide level because that's the precursor to insulin. And uh, it will hang around in a predictable way as opposed to insulin gets used up quicker or slower depending on activity. and various other things. So uh, C-peptide is a better way to measure insulin. We also know that uh, people that are, have type 2 diabetes are often obese, almost always obese. Um, and we're starting to learn more about these adipokines. Uh, these are uh, hormones that tend to increase adipose tissue, leptin, adiponectin, TNF-alpha, resistant, uh, we've tried blocking them. We haven't been able to successfully create a great um, weight loss medication, uh, but it probably is in the not too distant uh, future. Now, most of the people with type 2 diabetes are adults, um, but we're seeing more and more adolescents. Um, and so these are the um, uh, onset of um, diabetes in youth. Um, so we call it MODI. Um, it uh, is often associated with uh, certain genes, and um, it is becoming progressively more common. Now, type 1 and a half diabetes is uh, um, onset, um, late onset of autoimmune diabetes. Um, and so it is a process whereby somebody comes in, they're 40 years old, um, they're not feeling well. Uh, you check a blood sugar and their blood sugar is 350. The challenge is have they developed type 2 diabetes or maybe they've developed this late onset um, autoimmune process. Um, the best way to tell that is to do a C-peptide, <clears throat> uh, maybe do some um, um, enzyme testing to see if they have any um, autoimmune antibodies uh, and uh, uh, see based on laboratory testing, whether it's this uh, type 1.5 or whether it is in fact a type 2. As we say, gestational diabetes, the pregnancy hormones basically create a um, state of glucose resistance uh, similar to what type 2 diabetes does. Uh, and these uh, women are at a greater risk of type 2 diabetes later on in life. And the complications of uh, diabetes, again, you know, we can check for these various ways. And just keep in mind that the pathology, since we're talking about pathophysiology, uh, is actually of the small vessels out in the periphery. Um, usually they'll get small vessel disease. They usually won't get as much of a problem with their big vessels, although they are at greater risk for cardiovascular disease as well. Uh, they'll get retinopathy, um, and they'll also have damage to their kidneys, so they'll start spilling some albumin in the urine. So here's the ominous octet. So a person presents with hyperglycemia. There's lots of different possibilities of where it might be coming from. The classic we think of is, oh, they've got decreased insulin secretion. And that often does happen as people age. They produce a little bit less insulin. 
especially if they're obese, they can't keep up with the insulin demand. Um, but there's lots of other things that can that can happen. The incretin can be inadequate. They can have uh, increased lipolysis. They can actually absorb glucose more. They can have decreased uptake, um, neurotransmitters, and especially appetite issues. Uh, they can have increased hepatic glucose production. Uh, and they can also have this islet alpha cells. You're going to have a greater glucagon. So there's at least eight. Maybe more. Some people are talking about even more than eight, um, but there's at least eight possibilities. Now, I bring this up especially to talk about um, the um, uh, GLP ones, which hopefully I have that slide. Uh, no, I don't. So, um, at any rate, um, there is a, uh, another slide I'll post it on um, uh, Canvas that shows exactly where the GLP is going to affect at least four or five of those different areas. Um, laboratory testing, 85% uh, of type 1 diabetics will have the islet cell antibodies. No, not 100%. Uh, they sort of wax and wane, so sometimes they're easier to catch than others. Um, they might have the anti-GADs as well. Uh, and we already talked about the C-peptide. So this is a very quick and dirty basic introduction. Um, please uh, um, do some reading and watch the uh, USMLE uh, and other videos that I have. Um, it's obviously lots and lots of people have diabetes and I'm really quite surprised that uh, the pathophysiology uh, books that I've reviewed have relatively um, lean sections on diabetes. Uh, sounds like it. Thanks.